Good afternoon. Hi. I want to welcome you all to the annual client meeting for Mitchell Anthony Capital Management. We've got a nice showing here today, and we also have close to 75 people watching this event online today through our live uh, broadcast on the internet. So to everybody online, I want to welcome you as all, and thank you for attending our, 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 um, our meeting today. We've got a great uh, um, agenda highlighted for all of you, and I, and I want to encourage this to be as much a, of a discussion as it is a presentation. And so feel free to ask me questions and interrupt me uh, as needed so you can make the most out of this uh, presentation. Um, again, um, my name is Mitch Pletcher. You know me all. And I am the President and Chief Investment Officer for Mitchell Anthony Capital Management. We're going to have an opportunity today to do a little fellowship. We're going to talk a little bit about the firm. I want to introduce you to uh, the newest member of our team uh, who's here today, uh, as well as familiarize your, you with the partners who work alongside myself each and every day and uh, providing custody services and trading services for all of our clients. Uh, I want to familiarize you guys with what the services that we provide, what the services are that we provide. And um, certainly we want to look at our performance, what we've done recently, what happened in the year that just ended, what's happened over the last few years, and what the outlook is. Now, what do the markets hold for us over the next few years? Are we going to achieve our returns from stocks, or is it going to come from bonds? Might it come from gold or treasuries? Or what sort of environment's ahead, and how do we plan on capturing return from that environment. Most of you know the firm as being called Concord Investment Council. That was the name of the firm I gave it back in 19, or in 2000. Began the firm in 1991 as Pletcher Retirement Group. It then evolved to Concord Investment Council when I took on some partners. And as, then as the firm became more focused really on, on my wealth management business, my practice, I changed the name uh, to my own name, Mitchell Anthony Capital Management. And that, that's what Macam is all about, is the fact that the firm is mostly me. I've got two key advisors who work with me and uh, help me each and every day. Uh, but the firm is, uh, is about my advice uh, and helping guide you on what we should be doing with your portfolios and, and my decisions in making what we should be invested, my decisions for what we should be invested in each and every day. <coughs> Dane and Kyle, if you would join me up here for a moment. I, I've, I've restructured the firm a bit over the last five to ten years. We used to have a much bigger team than we have today. Uh, but uh, in pursuit of the very best performance, I decided that I needed to put the decision making in the hands of the people best skilled to do it and get my research from the people who are best skilled to do it. And uh, so I've kind of focused my team on some key individuals that I think can help me best do what I need to do, which is create alpha for each and every one of you. I mean, that's primarily what you're here for, is to achieve returns that are better than what the market can provide in a passive environment. And so I've had to enlist the services of some very good analysts over the years to try to do that. And it hasn't been easy. Finding a great analyst is very difficult in today's environment because it requires finding somebody with a great, intuitive, thinking, perceptive mind. And uh, those people are less than 2% of the population, I have found. And for the most part, they're not employed in Wall Street. <laughs> Wall Street tends to employ people who are very quantitative and uh, very judgmental and don't have the kind of uh, ability to ponder and evaluate and synthesize great decisions out of information. And our investment process is very qualitative. Uh, it's based upon a qualitative assessment of what's going on in the economy, a qualitative assessment of what's going on with asset classes and inflation, and a qualitative assessment of what's going on with central bankers and investment policy. And so I need help gathering that data and synthesizing that data so I can make a decision. First and foremost, where is inflation headed? 
Second and foremost, we're central bank policy headed as a result. And third, what sort of growth will we have in that kind of inflation environment and central, central bank policy environment? And so Kyle Aaron has been with me for close to 12 years now. Uh, I don't know, I know you guys have seen his name and pictures on our newsletter for many years and you have chatted it with him from time to time, but he's, he's got a great perceptive thinking mind. He's very intuitive. He, he provides some just outstanding research that's enabled us to generate the alpha that you've seen in your portfolios for the last uh, two to five years. We've, I think our, our performance has been second to none for the last five years. And uh, Kyle has been a key part of making that happen by providing me with some of the very best information I need, or best information available so I can make good decisions. And pursuant to that, we decided to add another person to the team looking for somebody who had the same sort of skill sets that Kyle possesses, and that's the addition of Dane May. Uh, Dane is a, a graduate of Purdue University, uh, a great education, uh, he's been a financial analyst for Bank of America and J.P. Morgan Chase for the last eight years. And uh, we've, we've got to know him and found him to have just terrific, terrific intuitive thinking, perceptive skills for doing qualitative analysis. Um, Kyle has a great education as well, went to UCLA, kind of missed over him a little bit, but he's got a degree in economics and uh, very bright individual. Uh, kind of separate from the engineering background that I have. You, I think you guys all know I went to engineering school, like most of you, and uh, kind of crossed over into the business world about five years out of college, and I've been in this industry since 1982 now, uh, and uh, enjoying it more today than I ever have. Um, our our uh, Dane and Kyle also help me daily with client service, uh, we're certainly um, uh, in a position of needing to communicate well about our clients, so it's important for the three of us to have great communication skills so we can talk to you when needed and provide all the guidance and service that's required for a comfortable relationship. So now when you pick up the phone and call us, if you can't get a hold of Mitch, then I want you to try to call Kyle. He's at extension 103. And Dane is at extension 105. Dane May, Kyle Aaron, very gr uh, good people who will help you with any kind of service need you have on your portfolio or any kind of information that you want or need about why we made a decision recently. So let's, let's take a minute and thank Kyle and Dane for their contribution to our portfolio. Thank you, guys. Dane and Kyle will be around to answer any questions you have and um, be part of our question and answer um, session at the end of my presentation. For the most part, <coughs> our, as I said, my job as your wealth manager is to provide performance. But generally, there's, there's, there's wealth management and financial planning that needs to be done along the way. We did a lot of that when your relationship began with us, and sometimes we have to do it over again as we assess some new goal that you might have, whether it's transferring your wealth to your children or whether it's grandchildren or children or you want to build college educations for, the proper allocation of risk given the returns that are in the marketplace. Uh, we think that we have all the skills necessary to provide you with great estate planning, financial planning, and retirement planning services, and I would encourage you to pick up the phone and call me anytime you feel like you have a financial problem that you need help answering. That's what we're here for. That's what my team is ready to, to help you achieve. <laughs> Our investment management, we can apply to almost any kind of an account, whether it's an IRA, whether it's a 401k plan, an individual uh, account, or a family trust. We're managing more and more 401k plans today. We're managing several corporate plans for Voya and through Charles Schwab, which has been a terrific opportunity for us to apply what we do in a, in a broader fashion and kind of leverage our skill sets across the big marketplace. 
<clears throat> we have five primary partners who we do business with. Uh, Charles Schwab is uh, probably custody 75% of the accounts that we manage and provides a great um, place for our assets that's safe and secure, separate from what we do, separate from the conflicts of interest that an investment manager might have, and uh, gives you that kind of line in the sand from your advisor and the money. And so having your assets at a separate financially sound custodian is of primary importance to you. And so that's why we work with these uh, five institutions. We're also working with TD Ameritrade more and more today, as well as Fidelity. We've had a relationship with Wedbush for 20 years now and still have a lot of clients at Wedbush uh, that we manage. And then our 401k plan management is being done through Voya now. And we're running a lot of 401k plans for uh, corporate America uh, through our uh, Voya custodian. <clears throat> My goals need to be tuned into your goals, so we're aligned, right? If, I, if I'm trying to do something that's not aligned with what you're trying to do, I think we'll have a problem, and so I feel <coughs> very motivated to align myself with uh, your goals. And as I thought more and more about it and looked more and more about what I could do better than what I've done in the past, it's about the return. It's about the alpha. But we all know what alpha is. I, I've mentioned that a few times at past meetings, but I know it's something you probably don't hear a lot. Fran is raising his hand saying, explain it, right? Yeah, explain. Okay, I'll explain what alpha is. Alpha is excess return that, we, that you get over a, over a bogey of some sort. If we have decided that, you, that uh, the bogey for your portfolio should be growth, then we might pick a growth index like the S&P 500 or the Dow Jones or the Russell 1000 or, or some balanced index like the AFE, which is Europe, America, and the Far East. But that's the bogey. And so if you're, or that's what we call a bogey. And then alpha is the return that the manager generates above and beyond the bogey. Does anybody know what the S&P 500 is up this year approximately? Anybody? If, if the, if, for many of our accounts, the S&P 500 is the bogey, or the Russell 1000. They're very similar. The S&P 500 is up around 15% this year, and our portfolios are up about anywhere from 18 to 22% right now for the year. Now, I'm going to get to that because I know it follows a year last year that they didn't do so well uh, in terms of absolute return, but still relative return. But anyway, our, our portfolios are up 18 to 22% versus the S&P, which is up about 15, that means we have two to 500 basis points of alpha. Did that answer your question, friend? He knows now, okay, thank you. So I wanna generate alpha for you, and we're gonna talk about the alpha we did generate and earn for you over the last few years, and what it came from, what were some of the key holdings and decisions we made that help us get ahead. And we're gonna talk about what we're doing right now in terms of how are we gonna create alpha this year? Where's the alpha gonna come from in 2019? What's the holdings? Is it gonna be stocks in general and what names? Or might it be bonds or gold or what are we gonna get our alpha from? How are we gonna beat the bogey this year? We're gonna talk about that. <laughs> My job is also to protect you from a meltdown risk, right? We all worry about it. In 2008, how many people were fearful that the markets were gonna melt down and markets might go to zero? Right? Maybe not zero, but lose half or more, right? We, we, we've all worried about meltdowns, and some of us have experienced that in the past. You know, the first big meltdown we had is, was in 1987. Then we had another one in, in uh, 90, uh, 95, and then we had the dot-com crash in 2000, and then the, the major uh, meltdown was in 2008 after the biggest economic upturn in modern times. Um, when our banks really got themselves overextended in the worst possible way. So that's my job, is to manage that meltdown risk and to not stay fully invested in something despite however strongly I might feel about it in the event things start to move against us. Obvious from looking at this room and from the people who are attending on the internet today, we have conservative money 
that's in our hands. These are your life savings. And I cannot afford to just be stubborn and stubbornly decide I'm staying invested. I'm not getting out and watch asset classes just melt down to nothing. So when markets start to melt down, I have to take action. Generally, if, if an asset class corrects more than 10%, I start selling despite how strongly I might uh, feel about a marketplace. You saw me do that uh, in September and October of last year when the market started to melt down. I shouldn't say melt down, started to correct. You saw me do that in 2014 and 2015 when we had some severe volatility and bumps in the road on the path to ultimately, you know, clear skies again, and clear skies again this time. But it's never, it's never clear whether or not those storms are going to turn into a hurricane or whether it's just, you know, a storm that's going to pass. And so unfortunately, I have to take defensive action and I have to manage the ship accordingly when there's a storm out there. And so that's my job. So you can relax and feel like, Mitch is going to take care of this for me. I don't have to worry about what's going on. I want the relationship to eat, be easy and comfortable. I want you to be able to trust that we're doing what's right. When you need money, you'll get it. Uh, when you have money that needs to get added, it'll get added in a timely way to the portfolio. I want an easy, comfortable relationship. I think we've done that in an outstanding way for many, many years. You've heard me say this over and over, but I'm going to say it again because you guys probably forget it, but my, my investment philosophy is is relatively simple. I have some strong core beliefs of what drives the returns in financial markets in general. And whether it's what drives the return in, in commodities like gold and silver, or what drives equity markets higher, or what drives bond markets higher, or real estate higher, or, might, or what might drive money back to cash. Now, I have core beliefs that I think have been proven over and over and over over the last 30 years that I've been in this industry uh, and if you stick to these core beliefs, you can do quite well in the financial markets. And it's all about three things. It's all about the fact that um, liquidity, first of all, is what drives markets. Markets move when money goes somewhere. When money leaves gold, it's got to go somewhere else. Is it going to go to cash? Is it going to go to real estate, stocks, bonds, whatever? So it's liquidity. The movement of liquidity is what drives your marketplace. So an investment manager has to be tuned in to where that liquidity is going. What's happening with liquidity and why might it be moving next? Be able to get ahead of that movement of liquidity. My job is to get ahead of where liquidity is doing, going in the year ahead. <coughs> and it's, my process is all about tuning in to what, what's happening with three things. First and foremost, inflation. Inflation sets the tone for what happens with any type of asset, any type. When you have periods of high inflation, where does money go? Fran knows. Come on, Fran, tell me. Gold. To where? Gold. gold, he said. Somebody said gold. OK. It goes to assets that are inflating in value, whether it's gold or whatever it has demand. When there is inflation, what, where you're getting your, most of your inflation, money flows to that, right? right? Uh, conversely, when you have low levels of inflation, you're not going to see money flowing to commodity hard assets because they're not inflating. Money's not going there. Um, and in that environment, money will tend to flow to other asset classes that are growing in value, like a company, like the stock of Amazon keeps growing in value, doesn't it? Because that business just keeps earning more and more money and finding more and more customers around the globe. So it's growing despite what's happening or might not be happening with inflation. <coughs> central bank policy is very important to the equation as well. What, what central bankers are doing with interest rates will set the tone for where liquidity goes too, won't it? Because they have a big printing press. And they can actually print money and put money into the environment and put money out there that will chase some sort of asset class. And when they're printing money and being accommodative, then, and we have low levels of inflation, that money tends to do, go where? Where does money go when the Fed's printing money and when there's low levels of inflation? Come on, this crowd's going to wake up soon. 
Larry knows. Come on, Larry. Help me, Larry. Does it go to stocks? Does it go to bonds? Those are kind of all attractive places for money to flow to when uh, there's liquidity out there and you don't have inflation. It's going to go to things that people think will grow. And so when there's uh, friendly central bank policy, people tend to believe the economy will grow. And as a result, they tend to want to own stocks. They also tend to want to loan real estate and other assets people think will do well in a good economic environment. <clears throat> the last thing is growth. We have to be tuned into economic growth. If there's not strong growth, corporate America isn't going to earn more money, and it would be hard for Amazon stock to, to go higher if their earnings are stagnant. Because earnings tend to set the tone for what a company is worth. The faster the rate of earnings growth, the, more, the higher valuation that's placed upon a company. Same thing with real estate. You know, when, when, a, when a, a real estate property has great income earning abilities, it's going to command a higher price. If it doesn't have any income earning abilities, it better have just good, a good price based upon some sort of demand because it's of, a, of how it's located. So those are the three things that we think lead financial markets and, 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 and push liquidity one way or another. We're going to talk about what happened with those over the last year, and more importantly, where are those things going and how are we going to react to it in the year ahead. Um, and we, as I said, we utilize five asset classes, stocks, bonds, commodities, real estate, and cash. You've seen all of these things in your portfolios over the years, and you'll continue to see these things in your portfolio over the years. The only thing that's changed with our investment management is I don't buy as many individual positions as I did. For, for some of us who were here 20 years ago, 30 years ago when I was managing money, I was buying a lot more individual bonds, wasn't I? I was buying a lot more individual stocks, individual asset classes. But now today we've had these great things that have come around called exchange-traded funds that allow me to invest in broad categories of bonds or broad categories of stocks or commodities or anything. And maybe avoid the company-specific risk and still have very good visibility of what, what I'm in. If I want to be in semiconductor stocks, I can buy a semiconductor ETF. If I want to buy consumer cyclical stocks, I can buy a whole pot of them. And you own them right now. You own a consumer cyclical ETF. But I also know that Amazon is the very best consumer cyclical company in the world right now. So what's the biggest position in your portfolio today? Does anybody know? Christine's, what is it? Amazon. Amazon. Amazon is the biggest holding in our client portfolios today because it's the fastest growing name in the world and a very mature company. It's the most valuable company in the world. And it's got great growth that lies ahead, we believe. So I want to talk about how how we did over the last few years. Now, these are the portfolios that I manage. I basically have these five choices. So when, when a client comes to me and they want uh, uh, to utilize my management, we decide which one of these or which combination of these choices are the best for them. And we have our dynamic growth and our dynamic income portfolios which is uh, our portfolio is where I'm going to manage the meltdown risk for you. I'm not just going to be invested in growth investments. I'm going to be in, invested in any asset class that can make money, and I'm going to move around within those asset classes to, do, to, to emphasize the, ver the most timely asset class. Well, right now, I'm 90% in stocks in dynamic growth than 65, 70% of stocks in dynamic income, because that's the timely asset class. <clears throat> I run two straight only equity portfolios, our diversified equity and our growth portfolio. We have a lot of clients who have these portfolios. They had great por performance the last few years. And then I run a bond portfolio that did extremely well from 2008 through 2015, but has done poorly since then, not because well, they've actually had good alpha, but just there hasn't been great return in bonds. We all know that bonds have produced, you know, 2 3% returns just because interest rates are near zero today. So let's talk a little bit about our most popular portfolio first, dynamic growth. 
let's look at what happened over the last few years. There's 2018 and 19, and here's 2017. We all, if you remember, in 2017, our dynamic growth portfolio made 28%. We made 28% for you guys in 2017 compared to the Russell 1000 or the S&P 500, which mirror each other, which was 21. That was 700 basis points of alpha we gave to you guys. How do we do that? How do we beat the S&P 500 by such a great margin? What was, what was the holdings? Did we trade the market and come in and out? Did we just have better holdings? We, <coughs> we did it mostly by having better holdings. I'm not a trader, as you guys have noticed. I don't buy things to try to come in and out. I'm not trying to anticipate you know, what's going to happen in the market tomorrow or next week or next month. I'm trying to anticipate what's going to happen to the market in the year ahead. And so I'm investing and I'm always giving your portfolios a gentle massage to push them toward what's happening in the marketplace. <laughs> and in 2017, I was heavily weighted in something called the FANG. Who knows what the FANG is? A lot of people do. Bill Woolley back there. Tell me what the FANG stands for. He's got it. The FANG is, is a group of stocks that uh, have become very popular because these are, the, these are the great, great slice of corporate America. These are the companies that have been growing, mature companies, mature companies with market caps over $100 billion each that are growing at double-digit rates and are mature. And these are the fastest growing uh, companies in the world of 100 billion plus market caps. And it's Facebook, Amazon, Apple, Netflix, uh, and Google. That's what we call the FANG. And we owned the FANG in 2017 before anybody was calling it the FANG. You didn't hear me at our 2017 client uh, meeting saying we own the FANG because it hadn't been labeled that yet. But those were the primary holdings in your portfolio outside of the exchange-traded funds. I, I, we saw Facebook as a key, key, key area of social media. We knew Amazon and, and Apple were key areas of what's going on digital in the digital media world with digital products and with uh, retail uh, um, consumption. We knew Netflix was taking over the world of um, telecom and the whole world of telecom, which used to come from cable companies and, and uh, you know, your uh, telephone operators was coming from a new vehicle that you stream to your TV over your phone and devices, and Netflix was a key player in making that happen. And then we owned Google, which was all about search and has enabled so much to happen in the world that we could never do before. So we own those names, and that's how we beat uh, the bogey and gave you 700 basis points of alpha. <coughs> and uh, this is this green line down here. I'm, this is actually the progression of how that alpha happened. This this chart here is is graphing the S&P 500. Here's the orange line. The white line is uh, the, our dynamic growth portfolio. And this is day by day how each day we were accumulating excess return over that bogey. This is a chart of the alpha, Fran. And you can see it, it, we, it, it got ahead. We're in, in uh, August of 2017, we had about 600 bips, and it slipped to about 300, and then it climbed back up to a high of, of uh, almost 900, and then it finished the year at around 700. What did it happen since then, since 2017? Well. <laughs> You can see the alpha graph peaked in September of 2018. We had over 1,000 basis points of alpha in September. And the portfolio at its high was up here. The portfolio was up around 15% or more in September. And we were far exceeding the bogey there. But then as people started worrying about the economy and uh, some of our hedge funds and institutional traders uh, got wise to what, how to manipulate markets, we saw a big short get put on in the marketplace in October of 2019. 
and the institutional and uh, investors and hedge funds decided to try to drive markets down by, by putting fear out there. And they did a pretty good job of it. And despite the fact that the economy was having its best year through this entire expansion, our market started to fall, kind of unexplainably. And as a result, uh, our alpha went because the stocks that they sold hardest, that were shorted the most, was the FANG. And we owned those. And we fell all the way to being down almost 8 9% at one point. But amazingly, our markets are not, now back up and close to those highs of September. Our portfolio is up over the last year and a half 14.3% compared to the Russell 1000 and S&P 500, which is up 10.7. And um, um, we've produced about 400 basis points of alpha through this period. At this point, in December, the market's bottom in December of 2018. Can everybody remember those days? Were you, were you worried? Were you a little nervous? Or you say, no, Mitch will handle it? A lot of us were worried. Our phones rang a little more than normal. But for the most part, our clients kind of hung through this and trusted. And you saw me, you saw me about right here, middle of October. I threw, once, the, once our portfolio dropped 10%, I said, I got to sell. I kept saying, no, I'm not. You know, I, I send you investment briefs. How many people read those investment briefs I send out to you? Do you enjoy getting those? Am I wasting my time, or do you want those? Let's show a hands of the people who want them. All right, seems like the majority of them. I'll keep sending them. Um, so I want to communicate with you and tell you why I'm doing it. And I was trying to tell you what was going on in October and, and why uh, I was staying invested, why I believed there was some, that this was more of a short than it was a real change in the economic fundamentals. <clears throat> and so for the most part, I stayed invested, but I did get to about a 20 to 25% cash position through this, ooh. Sorry, going the wrong way. <laughs> through this decline. And since then, the markets have been recovering, haven't they? It's, it's, in fact, the S&P 500 is now at a new all-time high. The Dow is now at a new all-time high. But NASDAQ is not, and the FANG is not. Uh, but they're, they're getting close. Our portfolio is not quite to its peak achieved right here. We're still about 3 to 5% from those highs. What's kept it from getting back to those highs? Why do you think our portfolio hasn't got back to the highs all the time that the S&P has? Anybody been wondering, why, why aren't we back at highs? My portfolio didn't, isn't back to the point it was in September. Anybody been wondering that? Anybody noticed that? OK, it's good. I guess I don't have to worry. But they aren't. We're not back to those highs, and for two reasons. Is one reason was, the first reason is because I went to cash for a while. And when the market started recovering, I had a 25% cash position in your portfolio that wasn't working. And so, you know, that was kind of the cost of taking defensive action. I took a sail of the sailboat down. So when the wind started to blow again, I didn't have all sails up. So all of a sudden, the index started getting ahead of me. Secondly, I owned and stayed invested in Amazon and Apple through that period. And they haven't got back to new highs. Amazon's all-time high was about 2,080, I believe. 2,080, $2,100 a share. And it's a right around 1980 right now. So it's still 10% off its high. And Apple is at 205 now, and its all-time high was 220. So those are key holdings in our portfolio, and they haven't made new highs yet, as people kind of wonder whether what's ahead is going to kind of uh, uh, change the, the, the growth strategy for these two companies, and, and they were highly valued. So we're going to talk about the outlook for them. Here's our other portfolio, which a lot of you hold, and this is 
uh, our asset allocation income or dynamic income portfolio. It's the same portfolio as dynamic growth, except it's done in a bit more conservative manner. As a result, it hasn't had as much volatility, and it didn't do as well. In, in 2017, it made 26% versus dynamic growth, which made 28%. Um, and it's back uh, today. Um, it's up 12% um, uh, over the last year and, or the last five quarters versus dynamic growth is up 14. So it's lagged a little bit because it has more a heavier allocation to fixed income and it doesn't have as much aggressive, uh, uh, doesn't have as big a positions in aggressive growth, which is and the FANG basically. Um, we have two strategies we run that are just straight stock strategies where I don't manage risk. I don't, I don't move to cash. These are for people who just say, I don't, I'm not worried about the volatility. I don't care if the, if the market melts down. I want to stay fully invested in stocks all the time. I think they're great. And that's what our diversified equity is all about. And it's done a bit better as a result. It's up, it was up 30% in 2017, our be, one of our best performers, not the best. And over the last <laughs> year, five quarters, it's up 18%. Better than the 14 that dynamic growth did and better than the 12 that dynamic income did. Why? Because we didn't move to cash. We didn't take the sails of the sailboat down in this portfolio. We stayed fully invested through the entire period. So there wasn't any kind of you know, defensive action during the volatility. So it's been more volatile over the years, but during periods where stocks keep coming back to the top as the best asset class, these portfolios have done better. This is our other straight equity strategy. You can see in 2017, it was our best performer. It was up 32.3% versus S&P only up 21. Over 1,000 basis points, 1,100 basis points of alpha. Um, lots of green. Oh, no. And then over the last um, five quarters, it's up 22%. So 1,000 basis points better than our dynamic income portfolio, 800 basis points better than our um, dynamic growth portfolio, and 400 basis points better than diversified equity. So this is a portfolio that's in equities all the time and in American equities all the time. This has been the best place in the world, believe it or not, if you were smart enough to know that. 500 basis points of alpha over the last five quarters. <clears throat> so let's talk now about, let's start to work on where we're going, right? We've got to talk about how we're going to make money in the year ahead because that's probably the main reason why people have tuned into this meeting today. They want to know how are we going to make money in the year ahead. And, um, well, we're going, to do it, we're going to do it by tuning into where inflation is going, where central bank policy is going, and, and, where the gro and if there's going to be growth and where it's going to come from so we can align the portfolio with where that growth is going to come from. We first have to decide, is, is inflation and monetary policy going to be friendly enough to keep money in growth vehicles like real estate and stocks? Or is it going to become unfriendly and push money out of it and push it toward, you know, take risk off the table and push it toward treasuries or gold? And so the outlook for inflation uh, is important to tune into. Have we been seeing much inflation in America over the last few years? How, how many people watch inflation? We're going to talk about that. For the most part, if you're looking at CPI, which is the government's measure of a basket of what they think are key assets uh, that we all spend money on each and every day, they're not registering a lot of inflation. Inflation has been in the 2% range for 20 years for the most part. It's gotten up as high as maybe three at times, and we had zero inflation in the world in 2009, 10, and 11, and we, we had negative, we had dis deflation in a few parts of the globe. 
So we haven't had an inflation problem overall. Why do you think that is? Why do you think we haven't had an inflation problem? This is something important to understand. If we don't understand why it hasn't happened, we're not going to be able to do a very good job of forecasting where it's going. So why haven't we had much, in, uh, much inflation in a world where central banks are printing money like crazy, right? How much money has the central bank printed over the last decade? Anybody have a dare to guess? Frank, guess? Fran? Bill, Wooly? Bill, Bill follows this stuff. No? Don. Don Wolf. How much? Trillions, he said. Yes. Trillions. That is right. The, the Federal Reserve's balance sheet was around $300 billion in 2006. In other words, that's how, how much money it had printed historically and was outstanding. Okay, just in 2006, so just 12 years ago. Today, it stands at 4.4 trillion. So we printed, we printed about $4 trillion of money over the last 12 years. <laughs> that's a lot of new money that's went into our economy that's chasing new goods and services. So why with all, with four trillion of new money, haven't we seen inflation? Excuse me? It's been, it's been bottled up for a few reasons, right? Anybody get, dare to guess what those reasons are that have bottled it up? Excuse me? So, spending? Well, yeah, we haven't, we haven't had a terrific amount of consumption going on in the globe, which has muted demand for goods and services. But how many people have been to Disneyland in the last year or two? Anybody in the room? Few. How many people would, would, would dare to guess what it costs to go in the door of Disneyland? Is it $50? 100 120 Kyle, what is it? Kyle takes his kids regularly. It's, it's over 100 I think it's $128 to walk in the door of Disneyland for one person. What was it 10 years ago? 50, 60? I mean, tremendous inflation in, in that park, right? How about the cost to go out to dinner? What are you paying for a steak dinner today? It's went up. Restaurants, you know, experiences, there's been inflation. I mean, you go to the chart house for a really nice meal, oh my God, you'll spend $200 for two or three people. Go to even a, a, a lower price place like Mimi's, you'll still spend 50 to 100. So we've seen inflation there. We've seen inflation at Disneyland and the parks, going to a Dodger game, going to a Laker game, going to a football game. Those have all went up hyperbolically, right? Be why? Because there's, there's, we don't have another Disneyland, do we? We haven't added capacity to entertainment parks. We, ha we haven't really built a lot of new restaurants. Anything that's been capacity constrained has had inflation. And things that we haven't been able to um, open up with you know, the internet and the digital experience, right? So our world of inflation has been tied heavily to where we can add capacity and where we cannot. Like what does it cost to get transportation across town today? When I used to get on a plane and go on a trip, I'd pay $40, $50 for a taxi ride from my house to the airport um, 20 years ago. Now I can do Uber and it's like $12. Uber has brought down the, the cost of things and, and we have all that kind of, all these new businesses that have came on and added kind of lower priced alternative to all kinds of things that we're doing. And technology is doing the same. I'm a computer used to cost 500 to 1,000 to 2,000 dollars depending upon low end iron. It's not any more than that today, if even that. Um, so we've seen a tremendous amount of new capacity added to things and as a result, no inflation. Uh, and we're not seeing it in America or anywhere really around the world but there are certainly pockets of it. I mean, labor costs have went up, labor markets are tight, and so we're seeing people make more money today than they've made in the past. 
uh, <laughs> here's a chart of the CPI, and you can see, you know, it bottomed in 2015 where it went negative, as we talked about, and then it had a, a significant rise getting up to two and a half. Started to fall back in 17. It rose again almost to three for a while, and now it's fallen back again to 1.5 to 1.9 this year. So still disinflation, deflationary forces in the world. And so inflation is showing signs of rolling over, and this allows central banks to continue to print money, doesn't it? Because this is their, their gauge as to whether they've, they've got to stop because they're letting inflation get out of control. So let's talk about central bank policy and, and, and how, let's give these guys a grade. How has, um, how did Greenspan do? How did his successor Bernanke do? How did his successor Janet Yellen do? And how has her successor Powell done? We've had four central bankers that have been at the helm during most of you guys' retirement thus far. For the last 23 years, 20 to 30 years, we've had those four central bankers. Greenspan followed the Volcker era. Do we give these central bankers an A, a B, a C, or a D? Anybody want to take a guess at what you think, or tell me what you think is a fair way to grade them? A, B, C, D, have they done an excellent job? Have they done a poor job? Let's talk about the things they did well and the things they did poorly. Uh, this is really important to understand, okay? Because this is this inflation and the central bank policy is going to tell us a lot about what's ha going to happen over the next few years. Really important. So the things the central bank did well was they kept our economy from melting down during several critical periods, didn't they? During the Great Depression, which was 2009 to 2012, many thought the economy would go into a deep recession like we had in the 30s and we wouldn't come out of it for decades. But we didn't, did we? Central bank, you know, Bernanke came to the rescue and didn't just lower interest rates, but he came off with all kinds of innovative policies uh, to, you know, put a life support mask on this, these sick people in the economy, our banks and, and financial institutions, that, which were very sick. So they saved us from crisis in the Great Depression. They also saved us from crisis in 2001 after the dot-com crash. They also saved us from depression after the 87 crash. So for that, we got we to gotta pat them on the back, don't we? Because a lot of people thought it might end there. and We might not have this great retirement. You guys are all enjoying a great retirement. For the most part, my clients are just it's better than anybody expected to be. They haven't had to use their capital as they originally thought. They have more money than they've ever exceeded. The money I'm managing has doubled or tripled or quadrupled for you. And you've just, you know, enjoying a great retirement. And we didn't have these financial crises that many of us worried about, you know, throughout, you know, our planning period. So we have to pat these guys on the back to some degree. Can we give them an A, though? I don't know. Let's talk about what did, what did they do wrong? What did they get wrong? Let's, for, let's start with Greenspan, because this is the guy who's been attacked a lot as getting stuff wrong, right? What did Greenspan get wrong? Anybody want to speculate? Did he print too much money? Did he not print enough? Was he too slow to put the life support mask on? Did he keep it on too long? <coughs> I guess to set the stage for what I'm going to tell you here, maybe we need to talk a little bit about what's wrong in our economy right now. And what's, you know, what is the root of, of all evil in America still right now? And so we, we have some things that are wrong. Um, what, why do you think the young people in our world are embracing socialism today? Why do you think there's more, you know, interest in socialism that we've ever seen in the last hundred years today? And it's mostly coming from Generation X and the young people. Why are these people interested in socialism? Security. Security. 
Christine says security. Is it just uh, suddenly they think that, you know, what, you know what, what's happened in Europe is great, you know, despite Europe being in kind of a mess for, for decades, that they want to follow that path? Or some people are even want communism. You know, they've embraced communistic type rules. They look at, you know, what's happened with China and, and the equality that's there. And uh, they look at what's happened through the Soviet Union and Russia and equality. It's a lot about equality, isn't it? There's a theme of equality out there, and the root of it is tied to central bank policy. We're going we're gonna, to we're gonna explain that. Central bank policy, I believe, I might not be right, but I believe is responsible for what's going on with socialism because it has turned, put, it's caused assets in the world to bubble. We have had this huge run in assets for 30 years now. The stock market was 1,200 when I, my first day on the job with Morgan Stanley back in 1982, the Dow Jones Industrial Average was at 900 and it moved to 1,200 over the next few months, but it was around 1,000. It's where now? 26,000? From 1,000, 26 times in my career. Real estate, oh my goodness. You know, real estate prices. I bought my first home, you know, for 40 some thousand dollars. You know, that same home is worth five, 600,000 now, up 10, 20 times. Asset classes or assets have boomed, haven't they? Whether it's stocks, uh, bond prices, interest rates in 1982 were 12%. They're near zero right now. A 12% treasury is worth 200 cents on the dollar if you still own any of them, okay? Assets have boomed in, in price because of the central bank. By pouring all this money into the economy for 30 years, he's driven up asset prices. And as a result, our younger generation feels priced out of the marketplace. They do not feel like they can compete. They do not feel like they'll ever be able to own a home or be able to have nice things. And so they want equality with Donald Trump and with other people who have millions. They're saying it's not fair for those, you, all you guys have million dollar homes that all inflated in value where you have, and now I want to buy a home and live the American dream, and I can't. I can't afford a, a million dollar mortgage. I can't get the down payment. And so they want equality. And so by pushing asset prices up so suddenly, or in, in, I don't know, suddenly, but in this strong manner, it's just, it's, it's reaped all kinds of repercussions in our economy. And to me, the worst one is socialism, because capitalism, I believe, is the root of innovation in the world and the reason why we have the fang. If it wasn't for capitalism, you wouldn't have Amazon doing what they're doing and Google having done what they've done for search and, and computer people like Bill Gates, who what, the, what they did for computers and processors and digital media and the, the great minds of of the guys at Apple, and, and all of this innovation is rooted in capitalism. And now we're risking giving all the innovation up in the world and being falling back into you know, a socialistic uh, world that doesn't grow or have innovation like we've seen in Europe. So I think it's the worst thing, and the root of it is, is monetary policy. What else has monetary policy done? Besides, besides you know, tearing apart our, our, our capitalistic themes, what has it done to labor prices? Why do you think we have a labor shortage right now? You know, employment is at an all-time high in history. One of the problems for the U.S. economy right now is, is the fact that it can't find good labor. We cannot find quality people to expand the workforce. Great companies like you know, Amazon even are struggling to put new, smart, you know, intuitive minds in place at their firms. The Boeings of the world can't find enough engineers. You know, we just don't have enough people in the marketplace. And we're, we're actually now starting to pull people into the marketplace who are, who are just kind of structurally, you know, uh, unemployable and, and, and not efficient, productive people. Why do we have this employment problem? Is it because we've just grown so fast that we've gobbled up everybody? Excuse me? 
She, uh, she, uh, ma'am, I'm sorry, I can't see. A... Yeah. Ann, yeah, Ann Schoonover? Yeah, hi, Ann. Um, Anne is pointing out the fact that maybe our population isn't as educated as needed to be to compete in the world. Very good point. Um, but I, I don't think that is the real problem, though. The real problem is back to what central banks did. And <laughs> the Dow's at 26,000. S&P's at an all-time high. NASDAQ's at an all-time high. Financial markets at an all-time high. 401k plans at work, you know, somebody who put, you know, funded their plan, you know, thinking they wouldn't retire till 65 or 70, they're now 50, and they're saying, I got a million and a half dollars. I don't need to work, Joan, anymore. And so we're, people are retiring early now because of the asset boom. They've made so much money on their 401ks and on a piece of property they own, they're saying, I don't need to work anymore. And so we've lost some of our best labor to retirements because of the asset boom. This great asset boom has caused people's wealth to grow so rapidly that they don't need to work. And so they've left the marketplace, and now it's hard to fill those people. It's, it's challenging for us to take a new college graduate and put in the position of somebody uh, who was highly skilled, gained a lot of wisdom, great judgment, and all of a sudden he leaves because he's worth a few million and he doesn't want the stress of corporate America anymore. And he'd planned on working till 65, and instead he's out at 55. That's one of the big problems in our marketplace. And it, the young people are struggling to fill those jobs. We hired a great guy, Rob. You might have talked to him on the phone, uh, who worked as an intern for me all last summer. Uh, and he's a senior in college up at Loyola. He's going to graduate in a few months. And uh, he just called me the other day. He said, Mitch, I want to come back to work for you, but... He said, you know, I've got three offers besides yours, and they're all over 100000 Can you match that? You were offering me $80,000. I'm like, I thought that was a good offer, 80000 for a kid right out of college? He's got three offers for over $100,000. And he says, quite frankly, your job's the hardest, Mitch. Your job's the hardest of what I'm being offered to do. You, need, you want me to you know, talk to clients. You want me to do research and... And you demand a lot. I don't know. This is, a, <laughs> it's hard to find good people. It really is. And so our economy is struggling uh, with these problems uh, that are all tied to monetary policy and the fact that we inflated assets and it's affected, you know, it's, it's changed the way our young people think about life, this in sense of entitlements that our young people have. I mean, I'm, I have the same problem with my own kids. They have this sense of entitlement. They grew up with too much, and as a result of the asset boom, we we're able to give them things, and now they don't want to work. They, they want equality, and uh, it's a problem. Here's what happened with interest rates um, over the last 10 years. You can see... In 2008, the Fed lowered Fed funds from 2% all the way down to zero, quickly, suddenly. And actually, if I had taken the graph back a few years, Fed funds was all the way at five going into the crisis in 2006. So Fed funds went all the way from 5% all the way down to zero and stayed at zero to 2015. And all of that print, this is when that $4 trillion of dollars of money was going into the economy, right? And ballooning assets up. And finally, we had a new chairman who came in, Chairman Powell, who kind of recognized the heirs of Greenspan and Bernanke and Yellen and decided, you know what? I've got to get interest rates up. I've got to, we've got to get America off its addiction to cheap money. Because we, we kept interest rates so low, as soon as interest rates would even rise a little bit, even something not meaningful, they'd stop spending. And the economy would slow. And we, we need to have a higher interest rate environment. So when, if we do have a problem again, I actually can lower. But with rates here, he has no way to stimulate if, if there is a problem. So he says, I've got to try to get rates up. And so he starts raising and ratcheting rates up quickly, right? Here we, we saw rates go all the way from zero all the way to 2.5% uh, by 
the middle of uh, middle to end of last year. Well, our, our kind of spoiled consumer said, oh my God, I'm not going to spend interest rates are higher. It's, now all of a sudden I have to pay 2% for short money or I have to pay 4% for more years. It just was three. I don't want to pay four. And so they stopped spending. And then you got Trump screaming and hollering, oh, the Fed's not doing a good job. He needs to he's more He's worried about getting reelected and, and wants the economy back on track again. And uh, it's not easy. What the Fed did over the last 30 years is not easy to reverse because he basically got us into this belief that we need to stimulate every time there's some sort of problem. And we really don't. We kind of realize that economy would have probably gotten out of every one of those problems without such drastic action, that we didn't need to do this to get the economy moving forward. It would have moved forward without that. And they left rates down too long. And so what happened here over the, <coughs> even though, so there were, were some real problems that started to develop in the globe last year. Besides it being a big short, we did have short-term interest rates go up. And it affected some things. It did affect some things. I mean, people who borrow money on their credit cards saw the banks trying to use those higher short rates as a reason to raise credit card rates, and mortgages went up. And, and housing slowed last year. Housing started to slow. It was a flat year. You know, new home sales and, and existing home sales were flat to down, first time in like five years. As a result, we saw consumer confidence start to roll over, too. Here's what happened with consumer confidence during that period of zero rates. It just kept going higher, right? Consumer confidence was down at a low of in the 60s on the index and climbed all the way back to a peak of 130. This was an all-time high in history. So consumers were very confident in September of 2030. It's September 30th of 2018. And then the institution said, all right, we're going to scare the hell out of consumers. They started shorting stocks, started bringing the market down. Portfolios dropped 10, 20, 30 percent. And all of a sudden, consumers said, oh my god, I'm afraid. And as a result, we had kind of some self-fulfilling prophecy here. And that confidence fell as a result of those that decline in wealth and decline in uh, asset prices. And confidence went lower. And as a result, um, retail sales started to roll over, too. Retail sales, which had climbed from $290 billion per month steadily all the way up to a peak of $342 billion per month in September of last year, fell off to about the 330, 339 level or something like that. So it started to roll over. Is it going to keep going down? I don't think so. I think it's OK. I don't, this, I, don't, I don't think we're in the midst of a recession. But the economy is reeling a little bit, from the, mostly from what happened in the markets, which then transferred into lower wealth. And also, we had some which transferred into uh, less optimism from corporate America. The PMI index is something that Dane and Kyle and I look at you know, every week to help us gauge you know, the optimism that's out there in the, in the minds of um, corporations. You know, CEOs, purchasing managers, anybody who's in charge of corporate spending. This index tells us what they're doing with new orders. And after we got those tax cuts uh, in early 2018, corporate America started spending money because they had tax cuts. And as a result, you know, the index got up to 60, almost its all-time high ever. But then when the markets decline, it's rolled over a little bit now. We've also had a decline in exports. What's the, uh, the, another, one of the other real things that's wrong in our economy is what's going on with trade. What has President Trump been trying to do with the trade picture? He's clearly been out there trying to negotiate with China and European leaders, hasn't he? He believes that we get a, a bad deal and that these people are uh, getting the better share of the deal when it comes to trade. China uh, puts tariffs on our products, but we don't tariff theirs. Uh, China steals our technology. 
China has been a difficult trading partner for us. China doesn't buy that much of what we uh, sell, but uh, uh, exports tremendously to our marketplace. Um, and we have similar problems with Europe and other emerging parts of the world, too. And so he's been trying to deal with that problem. Has he been successful? Not yet, really. I can't say it's, there's been a lot of success. There's been some, some modest success. He's made some dents in it, in, in the problem. Um, and it's a difficult thing to change. Uh, and the Chinese really want to fight. They're not really willing to cave. And so they've, they've fought, and as a result, we've had this tariff thing. We put on tariffs, so they respond, and they go on more. And then we put on more, and they've just went higher, haven't they? And what have these tariffs ended up doing to, our, to the global economy? What, did, what have the tariffs resulted in that's been meaningful? How have they played out in the economy? They've played out in the form of higher prices for all of us in some way or manner. You know, because all, it, all it's done is created higher prices for Chinese who buy our goods and higher prices for American who buys China goods. And that, where are those higher prices going? Who's benefiting from those higher prices? Is the American steel manufacturer benefiting from those higher prices? Is the American soybean producer benefiting from those higher prices? Is the Chinese computer exporter benefiting from those higher prices that that are, are being um, put on the prices uh, in America for his products? They're really not, are they? That money's going to government tariffs, so the governments are getting all that money. Not that it's a terrific amount and a big dent in the deficits we all run, but all those additional prices are kind of just going to the government's tariffs and not really getting into the hands of anybody that spends money for the most part. So it's resulted in some inflation and uh, as a result, slowed down consumption from both economies. And as a result, our exports, which had been growing nicely from 60 billion a month back in 02, all the way to 150 billion a month, have fallen back to 130 now because of the tariff thing. Doesn't look like in the volatility of a normal cycle, though, it's been too meaningful. And it's likely that the tariff um, fight is going to end now as Trump is moving into re-election mode. He wants the economy doing well. So we all know that presidents kind of, their rise and fall hinges heavily upon the state of the economy uh, going into the election. And he needs the economy to do well. And so I think he's going to kind of ease off his fight on tariffs. And the Chinese will as well. And this tariff and trade problem is kind of going to go to the back burner. As a result, we bought China in your portfolio about three months ago. We kind of decided, you know, China is gonna, this, China has not performed well for two years. We sold it all about two years ago. So we didn't want to own, as soon as Trump started proposing tariffs in late 17 and early 18, we said we didn't want to own any foreign investments. As a result, uh, this tariff would be bad for them. It might be somewhat bad for us, but really not, because they export a whole lot more to us than we export to them, so much more meaningful to them. So as a result, we didn't own it. We sold all of our Europe, all of our China. Good decision because those markets were terrible in 17 and 18, and we didn't own any of them. And, uh, but now we think those markets are going to come back. So we put that in your portfolio uh, about three months ago, and since we've bought them, they're up 12%. That China position we bought is up over 12% since we bought it. So a nice addition to the portfolio. So we don't think this is going to be a meaningful thing and it's going to move to the back burner. Um, I don't think what's going on in the globe and with inflation and central bank policy is really going to derail the U.S. consumer. However, back to our talk about what central banks have done. I, I talked about one, the central banks were responsible for socialism. I talked about how they were responsible for um, the balloon in asset prices. And I said there was three things that they did that were, to me, gives them a D. We have to grade central banks as a C or a D. We cannot give them an A or B. It's easy to do that in hindsight, right? <laughs> to be uh, critical of somebody. But uh, the reason why I give them a D 
is because of those two things. And the third thing is, is that they have killed consumption going forward. Because of lower interest rates and all, because of that $4 trillion of capital, anybody who needed to buy something has done it. They, we, that those lower interest rates ca caused all of our pent-up demand for goods and services that would have occurred you know, 10 years out to have been pulled forward and happened early. And as a result, we don't have any good consumption themes that prevalent in our economy right now. There isn't anything people want to buy. If they want it, they already bought it. They had the capital, they've had the wealth, can take the money out of their portfolios. People have been wealthy, and so they've been able to buy stuff. And as a result of this asset boom, we've pulled forward demand, and so our economy doesn't have any good growth drivers to it. There's no really engines of growth to push it, no engines of consumption. And so, you know, what is, every good cycle has a theme of consumption. You know, what do we have in today's world? What is a theme? Can you think of, what are we spending money on today? Can you think of a dominant theme that's in our economy that people are spending money on? I and mean, every good cycle has had it, right? In the last cycle, in the boom of, uh, boom from uh, 2002 to 2007, it was all about the house, right? Everybody buying more house, a second house, a third house filling up the house. It was a real estate boom. And then in the, in the 90s, it was all about dot coms and spending money on digital devices and websites and, and ways to leverage that. And in the 80s, you guys all remember, it was all about weapons and Ronald Reagan uh, winning the defense or uh, the Cold War with the Soviets. We spent tremendous amounts of money on weapons in the 80s. And then on energy. Those were all strong themes of consumption. We have any of that today. We're struggling to find one. People seem to be spending more money on experiences. It seems a little bit more about experiences rather than things, because you have all your things, so they want to take a trip, they want to do this or that, it's experiences. But that's, that's, that's not a great consumption theme, are they? They do, you know, I just bought a new Apple Watch. I wanted to have the latest and the greatest. I got this nice Dick Tracy watch here that that rings like a phone. It's got its own number and everything. It doesn't even have to have my phone near it anymore because of how sophisticated it is. And I got the latest, greatest iPhone 10, you know, that does everything. And so I've got that. And I've got a MacBook and an iTablet. And I've got every single product that Apple makes. And so do all my kids and my wife and everybody else. And so I bought all that. But and so I, that's the reason why I own Apple. And I do all my shopping on Amazon because I don't like to go to the malls and the stores, and I can get great prices on Amazon, so I'm leveraging that. And I watch Netflix at home at night when I want to watch a movie. <coughs> um, but So we're spending money on digital stuff, digitization of data, cloud computing, spending more money on defense again. Trump wants to build up the defense. Those are modest themes. You know, you notice I just added Lockheed Martin to your portfolio, and we own Boeing, which has done quite well. Um, another area of inflation, have you seen the prices Boeing is getting for their planes and what? Once again, where you've got capacity problems, you've got pricing power. Boeing has tremendous pricing power and so do the defense contractors on their products and they've been able to raise prices because there's not enough capacity to produce those things. So anything that's capacity to strains has pricing power, those things we want to invest in. But still, not great growth ahead. And so the world of strong growth, I think, is over for a long time. And I think we're entering a new period of economic growth. And I think, as a result of what central banks are doing, that we're not going to have these seven-year-long economic cycles again for a century, for probably 100 years. And that it's a Japan-like environment of, of long cycles that last 10 to 20 years where they kind of ebb and flow through a cycle without a bust. And you're not, we're not going to have these classic cycles where the economy it gets going at a rapid rate and the party gets out of hand and then it busts and everybody's got to recover and a hangover. I think that's over for a while. I think it's a, it's a long period of slow growth because we don't have any great consumption. At the same time, we have very wise central bankers who know, you know how to deal with slowdowns. 
And so we're going to have economic cycles that ebb and flow. And that's what we're in right now. This cycle began in 2008 or 9, right? After the last crash. Here we are. It's 2019, 10 years into the cycle, and we still haven't grown better than 3%. And it's ebbed and flowed through that cycle. You know, we started growing a little bit in 14, and then it slowed. It ebbed. Then it grew a little bit better the first half of 15, and then it ebbed again. And the market's pulled back. And then it grew from 15 all the way to 18, three straight years, nice, pretty good flow. And then now it's ebbing right now again, isn't it? It's kind of pulling back. So we're going to have these long cycles of ebb and flow where asset prices just stay very high. So stocks, they're not going to go down. Bond prices are not going to go down. Uh, certain real estate, it's not going to go down. It's going to stay highly valued because we're, the cycle's not going to bust. We're going to stay in a period of very slow growth until we, either get, until we get inflation. And there's just no inflation on the horizon. So long cycles that ebb and flow. And as a result, there's just not a reason to be afraid of risk right now. And that's why we have more risk in your portfolio than we've ever had before. Because risk is on in this marketplace. Because there's no recession on the horizon. There's, uh, no, there's, there's, there's nothing out there that's going to cause this cycle to crash. There just isn't. The Treasury is finally starting to, or the, the central bank has actually cut its balance sheet down from about $5 trillion to about $4.1 trillion right now. So it is in the mode of reducing its balance sheet. It's going to try to get it. But Powell's doing the right thing. He tried to raise rates a little too quickly and scared people a bit. And then the hedge funds got on and created more scare. But he'll get back at it again. As soon as the economy starts to flow again, he's going to get rates back up. His goal is to get them back to 4%. But we're going to be in this cycle of slow growth for another 10, 20 years. And we may not have a recession. We'll, we'll have another period where it ebbs. But I don't see a classic crash recession for a decade, at least. And the result, you know, the Dow's headed to 50,000. These prices are just going to keep going higher. And we're just going to have higher PE ratios, higher valuations on great companies like Amazon and Apple and all of these great defense names like Boeing, they're just going to get worse because there's nowhere else for money to go. And there's no inflation yet. <clears throat> so that's, that's kind of a summary. I, you know, you're going to see me stay invested in equities. I'm, I'm just now starting to broaden the portfolio out into, into some global equities. I want to own China because they're going to benefit from the fact that, tra that Trump has taken the gloves off. <laughs> He's going to be friendly now. I'm really kind of avoiding fixed income. I think we, you know, I did miss a little bit of a rally in treasuries. I could have, if I would have tried it to trade around this problem, and when I saw the, the short start to go on, I could have jumped on treasuries and jumped out of stocks, sold the fang and bought those, but I was afraid I'd get it all wrong. Treasuries did rally. I mean, we saw, you know, the 10-year treasury fall from 2.5% to, you know, 2%, and the 30-year go from 34 to 2.9. So there was some money to make there when those rates fell. I, that, that Treasury rally is over now because the economy is back ebbing now. And until it picks back up, the Treasury rally is over. So I don't want to own fixed income here. Well, I think real estate is still fine. I think it's just like stocks. It's going to stay highly valued for a long time. It's not going to sell off. Uh, Commodities, there'll be some selective areas of commodities that do well. Energy is going to gradually do better. It, it's ebbing and flowing. You know, oil got up to $65, $70 a barrel a few times over the last year, and then it falls back to 45 or 50 So it's going to ebb and flow. Cash is going to stay trash. And um, that's kind of it. That's kind of the forecast. And uh, the key is we've got to find the better part of the growth in the portfolio. We've got to find the areas of corporate America that are going to grow the best and the few areas of the globe that are going to grow well. We're going to stay in, in the fang. We haven't left Facebook. We think Facebook is going to get their hands around their kind of regulatory problem. I kind of thought it was crazy that we expected Facebook to you know, guard social data like they're a vault. They're really not. You know, that's not a vault. It's, it's just information that people have authorized. And for the way Congress has jumped all over them because they didn't vault their data properly, I don't know. They're going to get over that. And the, you know, what they've done to enable us to share things is dramatic. And the same thing with Google and all of these. And 
I think people are worried that you know, Amazon is listening to your Echo device. Like, I've got an Amazon Echo back there. <laughs> Alexa, play music. Talk to Alexa, Dane. Alexa, volume nine. Okay, so we've got Alexa, and you know, people think you know uh, Jeff Bezos is listening to us now and heard our meeting and <laughs> spying on us. And Congress is all worried and wants to attack, you know, these companies. Uh, it's going to blow by. I don't know. It's a lot of political nonsense. Alexa, pause. Um, so anyway, yes, sir. In the back, there's a question from Harry Bethke. Dane, can you repeat the question? I didn't hear it, and I'm sure not everybody did. Harry would like us to chat about oil prices, correct? Yes? I'm sorry, I'm having a little hard time hearing. I guess I need to get a hearing aid. Uh, well, yeah, I mean, it's kind of part of the discussion about global strength and commodities, right? Um, we're, in a, we're in a world of slower growth. You know, our, our great growth is behind us. The world's great growth is behind us. China's going to grow because they've got real population growth. But we don't have much population growth. We really don't. I mean, gosh, the average woman who has a child is down from... 80% of women in America 20 years ago had a child by the time they were 50. Today, it's less than, it's less than 50%, believe it. No, it's less than 60%. So women in America are not having children the way they did. In the nifty 50s, when you guys were growing up, it was in to have four kids, six kids. Fran has eight kids. Uh, it was in, but it's not today. And so our population is not growing, and we are, well, it is to some degree because we have all these immigrants coming in, but they're not educated. As uh, Mrs. Uh, um, sorry, Schoonover said, um, you know, so we don't have a highly educated population as a result of all the immigrants we have in our country. Um, but our population isn't growing, and globally things are not strong, and hence the demand for energy isn't there. Demand for energy has slowed, and as was, uh, also technology has allowed us to um, bring other alternatives into the marketplace. And we're also using technology to increase production of oil. And uh, you know, it used to be fra you know, five years ago, just five years ago, fracking had break-even points of $75 a barrel. Well, now they've got these great technology where they can drill down, go sideways, horizontally, inject water. They can just get oil out. At, now frackers can make money at $40 a barrel. And now America is the number one producer of oil in the world. We have passed OPEC. We're producing like 11 billion barrels a day. Uh, number one producer, far greater than uh, Saudi Arabia. Um, so as a result of this increased capacity, Harry, Harry um, oil prices have not been able to climb, and at the same time, consumption of oil has been soft. It's growing. Oil consumption it continues to grow, but it's not growing as fast as the global economy. It's lagging it. That's why we've had kind of muted oil prices. And we kind of expect it to ebb and flow with other... Com I think oil might be one of your best commodities, actually, going forward, though. In terms of, if you look at other commodities, gold, silver, um, uh, usable, buildable materials like nickel and palladium and, and, and copper and brass, these things uh, are, are, have been flat as well, to, tilting upward to some degree because of tariffs. But I'm not, not really excited about oil, to be honest with you. And as a result, you notice I don't own a lot of energy in the portfolio, and it's been good. Energy has still been one of the worst performers in the marketplace over the last five years, and you own very little of it in your portfolio. Yeah, um, Mr. DeZurich has a question. Hey, Dane, do you think you could get another microphone to hand to people when, uh, when they question? But go ahead. Okay. 
Okay, his question is about, you know, what's the outlook for America, for our economy, for our markets, uh, given different political uh, um, opponents that might move in? And I guess in particular, worried about a democratic, uh, a move to a de democratic leadership in the in the in the economy. Yeah, I, I think Trump has has been a good thing for the for the economy overall. And as much as you know, we can all have a lot of distaste with about the way he goes about things. I think he is. He's really giving America a lot of the medicine that it needs. Uh, and I think, I think a, a democratic leader can do that same thing. I don't think it's about you know, being a Democrat or Republican, but it is certainly about that person in general. And I, I haven't seen myself any democratic leaders out there who seem capable of, of doing what America needs done. And so I would be concerned if you know this socialistic, liberal population of ours decides to vote in um, a Democrat like Bernie Sanders to, to lead our economy, I, I think that would be horrible because it's just it'd turn America in further toward Europe and toward socialism. It's just, you know, I'm concerned about what he's doing to health care right now. He's talking about uh, a, a single payer system, right? He wants uh, us to get rid of our health care providers and replace it with a government, single payer where the government is your payer and you insure entirely through one person and he manages it all and it's, it's their way of really kind of extending benefits and subsidizing health care uh, rather than um, uh, you know, feeling like the government can do a better job of, of I mean, to me, it's a bit of a joke to think that the government, which can't run the post office, could run the healthcare industry better than United Healthcare or Anthem or some of these great healthcare companies uh, do. Um, it, you know, it, it would take a slice of the profit out, and clearly, those companies are making a profit. But it also, we know that it would just terrible productivity. So I think that would be one of the first areas that would be hurt. You know, our United Healthcare stock, which We've made 400% on since we bought it about eight years ago. You know, has fallen from 280 bucks to 225 or something right now as people worry about a single payer system and Medicare for all theme that Sanders uh, is talking about. Uh, so I'm concerned about it, but I don't believe that it's gonna happen. I think, I think Bernie Sanders getting into office is is not gonna happen. But if it were, it start to look like a reality, I would not want to own stocks here. I wouldn't. I'd, I'd start to worry more about inflation and, and I'd want to own a different asset class. What about the VA system? Don said something? Yeah, you know, there are some things that the government has done well in the past, but it, it seems like there, it's got they couldn't run the FBI right. They couldn't run the CIA right. I don't know. Do they do a good job at, with the FDA or you know, overseeing and regulating the medical industry? And some of these areas they do better. Working with our defense contractors, I don't know. If it seems like a job in some of these areas. Not complete failures, but no. I, you know, it's, it's, I believe Ronald Reagan's theme of less government is what we need in private enterprise. But you know our private enterprise is kind of screwed up too, and that we, you know, we have more greed in America than we ever have. There's so much self-serving type of mentality in the world that's taken over, and it, it's hurting our economy. It's hurting the globe, and you know I've never seen America this sharply divided ever, you know. And that division, it's, it's not good. It's not healthy, and it's got to play havoc with some things. And but at the same time. It, you know, normally that sort of thing would cause me to sell stocks, but we're in this period where assets are going to stay up because of the slow growth environment, the low inflation, the innovation, all of that. So it's all tied together. And if Democrats got back in, I'd start to worry about innovation. I'd start to worry about inflation staying capped up and asset prices staying high. The whole thing could start to unravel. So that's the reason why when people start to you know, think of that, they sell stocks. But I think we'll get through it. Other questions? Yes, sir. I, I see you're streaming your presentation. My question to you is, are you going to do more streaming?
in in the future in a way of communicating with us? Mr. Barclay's question is about the streaming event that we did today for our meeting, and uh, do we have plans to do more of it? Yes, we do. We're, you know, Dane is a new addition to our team, and he's very uh, uh, literate on technology, and he's given me an avenue to, to, to do this sort of event, and we're actually planning on having you know, a quarterly review at the end of each quarter that we stream to you, where we're going to get an update. Kind of, this is kind of a whole year at once, but I'm going to try to do a review where I stream it to you online as well. And uh, so thank you for appreciating what we put together. And right. We have about 300 relationships that I have. I have about 300 clients. My average client has about a million and a half dollars with me. And for the most part, they don't come to my meetings, though. There's, I think we got 50 people here, and we got another 50 coming to tomorrow's meetings. Most people are kind of happy. Uh, um, but they have hungered more for a way to tune in outside of my newsletters and briefs and things. And so that's why we did, like I said, we have 80-some people tuned into this meeting right now who are streaming to it. Uh, online. So our clients who aren't here, well, I have an aging group of clients too. A lot of my clients aren't in the position to be able to get in the car and come. I'm just so grateful for the ones who did come here today. And I have a, I've got a fairly large following in the medical profession. So for those of you who are out there in the Newport Hogue Anesthesia Group, I thank you for attending. And uh, I've got a great following of, of, uh, of uh, surgeons. I've got a great following of teachers. So we've got some some followings in other industries of people who are working and can't come. Um, but uh, we are going to use technology more, so the answer is yes, Bob. Anything else I can answer? Frank has a question. <coughs> uh, we're going to pick the best event of today and tomorrow, and then we're going to put that on our website so you can view it online. It's, it's, it, we, Dane's turning this into a YouTube video, which you'll be able to watch and review it. And we'll have tomorrow night's event. One of the two will be online. If they're both OK, we'll put both. And like I say, we'll put the quarterly ones there, too, so you can view them. Any other suggestions that you would like? What, what do, would you like to see me do more of? What do you feel like you want more from Mitchell Anthony Capital Management? Besides more alpha. More alpha. Besides more alpha, is there a service you'd like to have more of? Uh, yeah, Don has something. Yes, Don. About, you're doing so well. I have very little losses. A whole lot of gains. And I was concerned about if we hit a pump and we decide that it's necessary to cut back. How do you cut back without giving me a huge Don's question is about you know kind of managing portfolios tax efficiently and also managing risk, and I'd say the answer to the question is I can't. And I created a to some I had a lot of I guess distressed clients who got there when you when I went 20 percent to cash in October of last year for clients who have taxable portfolios. Some of you guys had two hundred thousand dollar gains. A million dollar portfolio, I mean, most of my portfolios, if you look at your portfolio, it's worth, if you look at a million dollar portfolio that we've been managing for, for seven years or longer, 600 to 800,000 of it is gained. The basis is like 200,000. So I can't sell anything without taking a gain. So I can't go to cash and protect you without taking a gain. And I did. I, t I took these portfolios as much as 30% to cash. And a million dollar portfolio, I created a hundred to one hundred and fifty thousand dollar gain, in doing it, uh, which meant a twenty thousand dollar tax bill. And a lot of people said, "Oh my God, Mitch, what the hell did you do to me?" And I'm like, "I'm sorry, but you know, I couldn't let the portfolio melt down. And at some point, those taxes do need to get paid. A lot of us have our retirement accounts and 401ks where it doesn't matter. And what I do there, if you let's say you have two million dollars with me, and a million's in your IRA and a million's in your taxable account." When I move to cash, I'll always do it with the IRA money and not your taxable account. So the only reason why some of you got a tax bill is because I wasn't managing IRA money to where I could, I could take the defensive action in that sheltered account. 
and not do it in your taxable account. Did I answer your question, Don? I guess I'm telling you I can't. I can't. I, I, do you want me to let Amazon go back to $1,000 because you don't want to take the gain? Right? Do you want me to let Boeing go back to you know, $200 because you don't want to take the gain? I can't do that. I, if it's time to sell, I've got to sell, and we'll just be happy we have gains. Don's question is, is there other ways to protect the portfolio? Well, I've tried it, and it hasn't worked very well. It just hasn't worked very well. Options are messy, and they seem to expire just after or just before you needed them. I just haven't found these other ways to hedge the portfolio. They end up being, you put them on, and then you didn't need it, and you paid a lot of money. To hedge an entire portfolio is very expensive. If you had a million dollar portfolio, for me to properly hedge 30% of it, I'd have to spend $20,000 on puts. And then if it doesn't happen, they all expire worthless and I lost the money. So it's not an easy strategy. I've, I've done it, and if you want to do it, I could do it for you and we'll embrace doing it for anybody who's interested in it. But it, it's had limited success. What else? Any other suggestions back? What can I do to make you happier that you have Mitch managing your money? Is there anything I can do? I know what you can do to make Mitch happier. Just give me a referral once in a while of somebody else who would love to have that alpha. Frank could give me Joan's uh, referral, and uh, um, Fran could give me, oh, Joan too. Uh, <laughs> but anyway, send me an email. If you, if you can't think of anything today, I'm, I'm here to make, I'm a part of my life where I've taken a lot of pride in what I do. And I want to do a good job for you guys. And that means uh, performance, number one. I want, it, I want you to feel like Mitch gets your portfolio where people are going ahead of time and, and, and is creating the very best performance that could be created for somebody with your goals. That is my goal. I want to do that. But I also want you to, I want the relationship to be good too and service you as needed and we're going to get somebody hired to replace Jill soon like I say she was a fantastic member of our team and we'll find somebody just as good to be there to help you and in the meantime Kyle and Dane and I will be there to do anything you need thank you all so much for taking the time to attend and thank you for everybody who's online for uh, attending our session again this 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 will be available on our website if you want to replay it and see it again in the future and so with that I will in the presentation here and be around for as long as it takes to answer any individual questions you have. Thank you.